Throughout cinema history, there have been several sequels that aren't really sequels. Usually these are unofficial sequels that are only titled as if they're sequels, even though they really have nothing to do with the movies they're supposedly following up on. Well, here we have an example of a movie that's technically an official sequel, but it's not titled as if it's a sequel, and when you watch it, it doesn't really seem like it's a sequel. You'll see what I mean. War of the Gargantuas, or as it's known in Japan, Frankenstein's Monsters Sanda vs. Gaira, is a 1966 kaiju movie that serves as a sequel to the previous year's Frankenstein Conquers the World. Well, kind of. This is one of those movies where you really don't have to have seen the first one in order to understand it. I mean, I didn't. In fact, even after I finally saw Frankenstein Conquers the World, I had no idea the two movies were supposed to be connected until years later. This wasn't helped by the fact that any references to the previous movie were almost completely removed from the film's American release, which tried to present it as a standalone movie. Well, mission accomplished there. This movie works better as both a standalone movie and sequel than something like Soldier, which was apparently supposed to be a sequel to Blade Runner? The fuck? United Productions of America, made in Japan. Let's see, a boat in the middle of a storm at the beginning of a Japanese monster movie? I'm sure this guy's gonna be just fine. Oh shit, it's even worse than I thought. Not only is this guy probably gonna die, but I think he's about to get raped. Push that. See? Even he knows what to expect in this situation. If you remember my Frankenstein Conquers the World video, I said there was an alternate ending filmed with a giant octopus that ended up getting cut, so might as well just put it at the beginning of your next movie. <laughs> oh, oh, well there's a switch. The sushi's about to eat him. Alright, alright, fine, I'll take that one. Lucky for this guy, he's near Japan, which means another giant monster isn't far behind. You know, in most American monster movies from the time, the octopus would be the main focus of the movie. Here, it's just an appetizer. However, this green giant proves to not be very jolly. Ho ho ho, motherfucker. Fun fact, War of the Gargantuas is also what the porn spoof of this movie is called. War of the Gargantuas, starring two Americans and eh, a bunch of Japanese people, who cares. In a surprising twist, that guy from the beginning that I was sure was gonna die actually managed to survive all this. The others must have been trapped below the deck when she sank, huh? Yes, sir. But there's something strange about this accident. The fisherman keeps saying his boat was sunk by a monster. Oh, wait, did I say strange? I forgot we're in Japan. I meant standard. Kumi Mizuno returns from Frankenstein Conquers the World, playing a Kemi, so not the same character she was in the first movie. Yeah, remember what I said about this movie being only a sort of sequel? However, Nick Adams doesn't return this time around. I guess he ditched his romance with Kumi Mizuno in order to go after Fuji. Instead, our main character is played by Russ Tamblin, who's most famous for West Side Story. But instead of Jets vs. Sharks, it's gonna be Jets vs. Giant Monsters here. Russ plays Dr. Stewart, who I guess is an expert on monsters? Sir, you've studied giant animals. You had one in captivity, didn't you? Yes, that was five years ago. He might have been a young species of a gargantua. Uh, sir, what's a gargantua? You can't just toss that word around and expect me to know what you're talking about. And in case you didn't know, this movie is a sequel. Dr. Keita at the university. Oh, you know him? Yes, indeed. I studied that uh, desiccated hand he found in Pangbosh. See, we kinda sorta reference Frankenstein's severed hand from the previous movie. That means this counts as a sequel. Did you see that news story in the paper last week? You do mean the one about the Alpine students, don't you, where they claim to have seen a giant monster running around in the snow? Yes. Mm, they were probably on a bad LSD trip. Yeah, or an awesome one. Let's see if the fisherman has anything to say. It was a monster. We were sunk by a hairy green giant. There was also a giant octopus, but I don't know if I'm ready to talk about that. Let's just say that that night, I was the fisherman's wife. If I were gonna tell a lie, I'd think of something more believable. 
than a gargantua. Oh yeah, here's another thing. Throughout the whole movie, people use the word gargantua as if they're these things that everyone knows about, yet no one seems to believe that they actually exist or are responsible for what's going on. Tell us, Doctor, is your gargantua alive now? Well, even if he did come back, he wouldn't be living in the ocean, and he wouldn't be doing things like tipping over boats. We're eating human beings. Yeah, I don't know why people would possibly think something called a gargantua would do stuff like that. It turns out that these two originally took care of Chaka from Land of the Lost until he ran away and disappeared. I guess they must have called him a gargantua as an ironic name. Look, in all the time that we had him here, he seemed more gentle than most human beings. You know, maybe you should recheck that fisherman's story again. Yeah, you hear that, pal? I don't care if you almost got killed. You're a damn liar! One thing's for sure, something is definitely terrorizing Japanese bitter beer face man here. Actually, the weirdest part about all this isn't the fact that there's a giant green monster on the loose, but that Dr. Stewart apparently refuses to think it's a gargantua. So Stewart knows these things exist, he hears various reports of people seeing them, yet his response is still, eh, the one I knew was nice to me, you people are all lying. They're putting the blame for everything on Gargantua. The fishermen say that they saw him. They just saw a head sticking out of the water. Exactly, that doesn't mean it was a Gargantua, it could have been a Gigantosaur or a Humungaclops. They get a potential lead when they see some photos of footprints that make Bigfoot look like regular foot. He's seen in the ocean, then the mountains. Do you suppose there could be two? Well, the name of the movie is War of the Gargantuas, plural. They decide to mount an expedition, presumably to see if the monster's hiding in the Paramount logo. There they are, Doctor. You can see them all the way up. Fun fact, the parts where there's only one set of footprints was when he was being carried by Kaiju Jesus. Meanwhile, at the University of Definitely Not in Kansas, a hair sample found on a wrecked boat leads him to believe that the Gargantua lives primarily underwater. That is, except for when he really needs to catch a flight. Attention! Attention! All aircraft are to turn away! An alert! An alert! This is Tokyo Tower! Yeah, want to know the real reason Pan Am Airlines isn't around anymore? Too many giant monster attacks. One thing's for sure, this is definitely going to lead to some delays. You know, I gotta say, it's refreshing to see a monster that hates airlines as much as I do. This is for charging 50 bucks for a check bag, asshole. We also learn that the monster hates sunlight, so I guess it's just red-eye flights for him. Stewart has got a lot of explaining to do. Now that hundreds of people actually witnessed the tragedy at the airport, how can you continue to insist that he is gentle? All those people at the airport are lying! Everyone in this movie is a liar except me! Here's a real fun fact about this movie. Russ Tamblin reportedly hated working on it and refused to follow the director's orders, often making up his own dialogue instead of following the script. And considering it looks like he has a black eye in this scene, my guess is that the crew must have gotten a little sick of his shit. Stewart theorizes that there might be two Gargantuas, although again, the title should have told him that. In the meantime, though, they're gonna have to figure out what to do about the one Gargantua. He is sensitive to light. I think that we should keep the city brightly lighted. Are you crazy? Do you have any idea what our electrical bill is going to be? I say we put a bunch of garbage in the ocean and hope he chokes on it. Dr. Stewart, what do you think? I think you're right. Is that all you can say? Look, Russ Tamblin really doesn't want to be here. Don't make him say any more lines than he has to. Oh, and in case you were wondering who the other American listed in the opening credits is supposed to be, it's... This lady. If my lips could only say the pretty words that I feel in my heart. Yeah, even in kaiju movies where they don't need to wake a monster up, we still get a musical number, whether you like it or not. Okay, that's enough of this song. Time for Mr. Magic Remote to switch it to something else. But with just one look into your eyes, I become excited and it's no surprise that the words get stuck in my throat. The words get stuck Come on, in work, my God damn it. I can't speak at all because the words get stuck in my throat. The words get stuck in my throat. Oh, good. Looks like the Gargantua got sick of this song, too. Turns out music doesn't have charms to soothe the savage beast. Here, 
turn her over. Yeah, and cover her mouth while you're at it. No, I don't want to make a monster movie in Japan. I was in West Side Story. The radio says a giant monster is headed towards the city, which I think is the Tokyo equivalent of a morning traffic report. Do you think Gargantua is headed for the mountains? Don't get excited, we're not sure it's him yet. Okay, I know I joke about there being lots of monsters in Japan, but I'm pretty sure this was a Gargantua. The army heads out to try and stop him, although I don't know how effective they're gonna be. The only reason he's running away from these lights is because he just woke up and hasn't put his face on yet. Shall we attack? No. Here he might kill thousands of civilians. If we only wound him. Look, it's a 60s Japanese monster movie. You're probably not gonna do anything to him. Once again, though, I do feel sorry for the actor in the suit. Not everyone includes getting set on fire as just a normal part of their workday. Well, looks like the tanks didn't work. And don't attack him with helicopters. Not every giant hairy ape monster is King Kong, you know. Well, that was your own fault. And this second guy has even less of an excuse. I also don't know what good microwaving him is gonna do, but wait a second. We got him! Holy shit, we're actually hurting him. We finally got one. Now it's time for him to duck behind some trees so they can reuse this footage in later Godzilla movies. However, before the army can finally get a victory... Hey, look! <gasps> Another one! Yep, we finally see the second Gargantua. Now in the Japanese version, the green one is called Gaira and the brown one is called Sanda, but in the American version, their names are a little different. Henceforth, the official designation for the monster from the sea will be Green Gargantua. Monster of the Mountain, Brown Gargantua. I guess it doesn't really matter. Most of the people in the comments are just gonna call him Sanda and Gaira anyway. Alright, fellas, I know my little brother was kind of a dick, but I'm pretty sure he learned his lesson, okay? Well, this proves there are two of them, huh? Again, you could have just looked at the title. Hopefully Stuart can give us some answers with his expertise, whatever that is. And that brown one, Doctor, what's their connection? Well, maybe if we don't ask so many questions and just, uh, try to find a few clues, we might discover the answers together. Wow, even the movie basically just said, look, don't think about this too much and just go with it, okay? They figure out that the brown Gargantua is the grown-up version of the one Stuart took care of when it was a baby, and the green one was cloned from his cells. In the Japanese version, both of them supposedly were created from the remains of Frankenstein from the first movie, who could never be truly killed, but because the American version omits almost all the references to Frankenstein, it makes it look like Stuart just kinda guesses all this and magically figures it out. If they're brothers, why is their nature so different? You mean because one's violent and one isn't? From the beginning of time, some brothers have been different. Yeah, just look at Dennis and Randy Quaid. Because blowing the Gargantuas up could cause their cells to multiply into several new monsters, the army decides instead to build a giant pillow to suffocate them with. Well, at least the giant monsters on the loose don't seem to have dampened this hiking glee club spirits. They don't seem afraid of Green Gargantua, do they? It's strange, you know. Whenever there's a strong evil force around, youth suddenly starts to blossom. Like when the Nazis captured Paris, all the nightclubs and theaters were filled with young people. See? No one ever talks about the positive aspects of the Nazi occupation of France. Unfortunately, these people made a big mistake going for a walk in Kaiju National Park. What's the matter? The giant! Uh, don't you mean Gargantua? Or possibly Frankenstein? And damn it, Akemi, couldn't you have just broken a heel like a normal woman in a monster movie? Now listen to me, don't panic. Just hold on, I'll be right down. Uh, listen, Akemi, Russ Tamblin barely even agreed to say his lines. I wouldn't count on him to save you. And I don't know if you can depend on Sanda either. I'm not sure that that was supposed to happen. Despite the Charlie horse, Sanda does end up saving her, though. Ho oh, ho, I think Akemi might be a gargantua size queen. Well, there's your love interest, and since I'm not King Kong, I'll just leave you two alone and be on my way. Besides, Sanda's got bigger things to worry about, like the fact that his little brother is still going around eating people. What? I was hungry and Chick-fil-A's closed on Sunday. Ah, a 
Right, I'll share with you next time. Jesus. I compare the fights in these movies to pro wrestling a lot, but because the suits are less bulky this time around, I think this movie comes the closest to actually looking like it. All that's missing is a giant pair of ropes for them to jump off of. Despite being informed that blowing the gargantuas up could cause them to multiply, the army just seems to ignore this. At any cost, kill them. But General... If you scatter those cells... Look, worst case scenario, we get another sequel that has nothing to do with this one, which means it's not our problem anymore. I feel really sorry for all these people in the countryside. Normally, it's Tokyo that gets destroyed in these movies. They probably thought they were safe. Even though Stewart says that only the green one is bad, the army decides to destroy both gargantuas. It's not just a theory that the brown gargantua is a harmless creature, it's a fact. A plain and simple fact that's already been proven. Okay, it's a fact because you say so? Look, if you hit them with that heavy artillery of yours, you'll blow them to bits. And then you could be faced with a thousand gargantuas. Your theories have not been substantiated. Yeah, the general's actually right about that. I prayed that we could save the brown one. What, you don't like the other one just because he's green? Racist. Gyra begins attacking the city, and you know the worst part about giant monster attacks? The traffic jams. Oh, and I guess the monsters are bad, too. I don't know what the army's worried about. Shooting them with lasers worked pretty well last time. Why don't they just do that again? I can tell you one thing, all of Russ Tamblin's dance fighting skills are probably not gonna work against this thing. Fortunately, he has a plan. That's the green one. Let's get out of here. Or not. Okay, remember, men, aim for the thing that looks like the Incredible Hulk in need of some manscaping. The army's plan makes a hell of a lot more sense than our heroes, which is apparently to have Akemi charm the gargantuas with her feminine wiles. Damn it, for the last time, these things aren't King Kong. And that's not Santa. Okay, I guess she's dead now. Nah, just kidding. Russ just needed to pose for a lobby card image. Alright, get ready for the War of the Gargantuas. Frankensteins. Sanda versus Gyra. Whatever. <laughs> Okay, Sando, we appreciate you trying to stop your little brother, but do you mind being a little less collateral damagey? Because they're brothers, Sando's gonna win by sitting on Gyra and then farting in his face. What? That's how I ended fights with my little brother when I was a kid. As I said before, the army tries to kill both the Gargantuas, and considering all they have is Dr. Stewart's word that the brown one isn't dangerous, that's actually not a bad plan. And I see the Japanese army still can't aim worth shit. Oh well, I guess they're still better than the one from Reptilian. The battle's moving out toward the port, sir. How can they stand up against such tremendous firepower? First time fighting giant monsters, huh, General? While I appreciate that the suits are less bulky here since it gives the actors a lot more mobility, with so much less padding, I can't help but think of them going, Ow, 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 oh, damn it! I think I just landed on a Lego. Once he pins his little brother, Santa is gonna give Gyra one hell of an Indian burn. The army also shows up with their lasers again, and what's more, I think they're aiming for Gyra's ass. You know, considering the lasers are so effective in this movie, the army is going to be really disappointed when they try and use them on Godzilla later. And come on, Santa, I know you're mad at your little brother, but don't dunk him too hard. You two play nice during bath time, you hear? Even though Stuart's supposed expertise did absolutely nothing to help this situation, at least his hot assistant isn't dead. Hello, Doctor. Oh, please, Akemi, call me Mr. Doctor. And it turns out both Stuart and the army didn't even need to do anything since an underwater volcano appears out of nowhere and takes care of the gargantuas for him. What? The first movie ended abruptly with Frankenstein getting swallowed by an earthquake? Logically, that means this one needs to end with a volcano. And I do mean the movie ends abruptly, since almost immediately after the volcano appears, they say that the gargantuas have just disappeared. It's apparently the end of both. Did they confirm it? No, but no living thing could have survived. What I'm saying is, if you were hoping for a third movie called Frankenstein 3D, you're gonna have to wait for Paul Morrissey to make that. 
Although it wouldn't get a release in North America until four years after it premiered in Japan, War of the Gargantuas would go on to become arguably one of Toho's most popular non-Godzilla kaiju movies through numerous showings on late night TV, with people ranging from Brad Pitt, Guillermo del Toro, and Quentin Tarantino all calling themselves fans of the film. And I think I've mentioned this before, but is anyone else curious what a Quentin Tarantino giant monster movie would be like? Even Russ Tamblin eventually warmed up to it, actually appearing at some screenings of the film in recent years. It's easy to see why, too, because it's a fun movie. And like I said, you don't need to have seen Frankenstein Conquers the World to enjoy it. One thing that drags the movie down for me is it is painfully obvious Russ Tamblin doesn't give a shit about what he's doing here. Say what you want about Nick Adams, the guy at least seemed like he was trying. Russ acts like he's been hit with a tranquilizer dart before each take. Ultimately, though, he doesn't have that big of an impact on the movie, the important thing is the monster stuff. Right from the opening scene with the Gargantua fighting the octopus, this movie makes it clear that it's serious about being a ridiculous monster movie. It's a movie that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but it's entertaining enough that you don't care. If you're looking to get into some old school kaiju flicks that aren't Godzilla movies, this is a good place to start. Plus, the movie shows us the importance of acting professional. Even if you don't like the movie you're in, always do the best job that you can. Because if you don't, a snarky Canadian can make a video decades later pointing out how disinterested you look. Well, that's all for now. Until next time. He's living in the ocean like they say he does. Well, maybe he fell in love with a whale or something. I don't know.